Hello. This talk is about IOS 7. It's a bit of an overview on how IOS 7 works and the things you should know about IOS 7 in terms of actually building apps for it. This is possibly a short talk. I don't actually know how long this is because I've done four talks in the last four days. I haven't timed this one properly. So it could either really overrun or could go over in about 10 minutes. So we'll, we'll find out. Um, I'm Paris. You can harass me on Twitter there. I'm the co-founder of a company called Secret Lab. This guy here with the hat and the closest hat is the other co-founder. He also helped me finish off these slides when I had to spend half of yesterday on the phone. So that was fun. Secret Lab builds apps mostly for children these days. So things like Play School, Playtime, Play School Art Maker. And that one's not for children, but it's also for the ABC. It's called Foodie for the iPad. Uh, we also write a lot of books. These are some of our recent and current books that we're working on. So this talk is a little bit about design. Uh, and this is the, the handful of things that we're going to talk about today when we talk about design. We're going to talk about what's changed and why in IR7. A bit about the design language of IR7 and how it's kind of interesting. And some of the components of IR7 that you should know about if you're going to be attempting to design for it. Let's start with the what's changed and why. This is a visual summary of what's changed. So there was a guy called Scott Forstall who was the SVP of iOS software. That's his happy, smiling face up there. Apple has removed this picture from their website. It took, it took a lot of doing to find it. And uh, he was working with Johnny Ive, who was the SVP of industrial design or hardware design or something. He also has a happy, smiling face. Then this guy got canned, and Johnny subsumed his role. So this kind of happened. <laughs> um, so things are a lot simpler now with, with Johnny, Sir Johnny in charge. Uh, and the process of what we like to call deforstalization began. Now Scott Forstall was the guy who got canned, which is why it's called deforstalization. It's a noun. And Sir so Johnny I've being being British, the definition of deforstalization is as follows. It's the process of destroying the life's work of a forstall and replacing it with somebody else's work. So now we've got a quick example of deforstalization to get you in the spirit of things. If you imagine this is what we had before iOS 7. This is the before. And this is, of course, the much more streamlined after. It's a distinct improvement. And of course, both these pictures are Sir Johnny Ive. And this is him in his next days in the early 90s, and this is him now. And as you can see, he's a lot smoother and less geomorphic. <laughs> um, it, well, he is. Look, look, look at that. Is that not an improvement on that? So, in all seriousness, this is the, the change, as, as I'm sure you're all aware. It's quite a big change, really. And there is quite a stark difference between iOS 6 and iOS 7. And it's important to know about it. Now, in the spirit of Apple's usually really good documentation, I consulted the documentation. And I found this. I, I looked at it for a bit, and I'm still not entirely sure what it means. Um, I give a lot of Android UX talks as well. And Google has some really weird stuff on their website about how design works on Android. And it seems like Apple thought that was a great idea and has started putting up similarly weird statements. It's really airy-fairy and floaty and happy, but it doesn't really mean much in terms of actual concrete things you can apply, which is slightly annoying. Um, so subtle is my anvil. And profound don't really mean much. Um, that's profound. So I thought about it a little more, because subtle and profound kind of seem to be the, the gist of what Apple was saying, and that does not mean anything. Um, but when I looked at this again, I noticed this bit, which is possibly more relevant to actually what's going on. Uh, this is the key point. Apple is de-emphasizing physicality, i.e. making stuff look realistic, and emphasizing motion, which I'm not sure why it's not realistic, but apparently it's not. So de-emphasizing physicality and emphasizing motion is kind of the core of what Apple says iOS 7 is. So this is what Apple says is the three main themes of iOS 7 when, once you move past the, the physicality in motion. Deference, which is basically the UI is meant to help users understand and interact with the content, but not compete with it. So the UI should be deferent to the content, I guess, or defer to the content. Clarity, so text is legible at all sizes. Icons are precise. I don't know what they were before, but they weren't precise, apparently. And lucid. Does anyone know what a lucid icon is? I, I don't. 
Yeah, I guess. Um, I don't actually know what half these things mean, by the way. So I'm trying my best to interpret Apple's very cryptic design documents for you here. Expelling all its secrets, yeah. It's really weird. Um, so icons also should apparently have a sharpened focus on functionality. This also seems like bullshit, but <laughs> apparently that's there. Um, and the final one that Apple says is depth. And visual layers and realistic motion should impart vitality and heighten users' delight and understanding. Now, I don't know what that means either, but it makes sense that things have depth in R7 because it's all about frosted glass. Um, so, deference, clarity, and depth are the three principles of R7 according to Apple. And when you think about them a little bit, they really do kind of make sense. Deference kind of means that your UI shouldn't be overbearing and take over. Clarity kind of means that your UI should be as simple as possible while still maintaining the features and the user needs. And depth means you should use the visual cues of the way the rest of iOS looks to make sure users understand what's going on in the UI. So it does kind of make sense. Just Apple described it in a way that apparently borrows from Google's, as we know, amazing design sense. So the three types of apps in iOS 7, and this is kind of an improvement on the way Apple described things in the past, because they just said there's apps and you should build them and it's great. Now they say there's three types of apps. There's standard apps, custom apps, and hybrid apps. Uh, standard apps are just stuff that looks like Apple's built-in UI kit, so things that look like you know, the phone book or the calendar, things like that. So you can build a, a, a standard app just by using all the UI kit pieces and not customizing anything. A hybrid app uh, uses bits and pieces of both UI kit and custom stuff, and a custom app is obviously a custom thing where you build the entire thing from scratch. Games are most often completely custom, and then everything else is kind of in between. Find My Friends, which hasn't been updated to look like iOS 7, is basically a custom app. Even though it's built by Apple, it doesn't really look like anything else Apple makes. It's received a bit of criticism. It's not been deforestalized yet. I'm sure it will be, because, you know, Johnny Ive doesn't like textures. Um, maps, the built-in Maps app, is a really good example of a standard app. All of the controls in the Maps app are built on UIKit. Um, obviously, except for the map view, which is built on God knows what. So that's the three kinds of apps you need to think about when you're building for R7. Now I'm going to take a quick look at things you must do when you're building for R7. And these are not just from Apple, these are from me as well. So these are things you absolutely must always do when you're building an R7 app. And the first one is translucency. You need to make sure all your app's content is discernible through the weird translucent UI elements that R7 has put everywhere. There's bars, keyboards, the thing that you slide up from the bottom of the screen, I forgot what it's called, control center. The, trans the status bar is transparent. Everything is transparent in R7. And if you don't think about that, you're going to end up with something that looks really horrific when you have a weird color underneath one and then something slides up and then you've got an orange blurry thing. It just doesn't work. So translucency is something you need to pay attention to all the time in R. So you absolutely must pay attention to this. Another thing you absolutely must pay attention to, and I'll come back to this at the end of the talk, is dynamic type. This is totally new to iOS. Apple typically hasn't provided much in the way of customization, and all of a sudden they have, and you need to do it. So in iOS 7, the user can adjust the text size they want apps to adopt, and you can, as your app, define different parts of text that respond to that. So you absolutely must implement this if your app has any text in it, because otherwise users will think your app feels weird and foreign. Remember that users will swipe up in iOS 7. The control center, which is the thing I just forgot the name of, is the thing that comes up from the bottom of the screen. And lots and lots of apps are not built with this in mind because it was never there in the past. So when you try and swipe up, the OS will try and bring up the control center. And if it doesn't need to bring up the control center, it will send the touch back to the app, but it will be slightly delayed. Or your app will just freak out, in the case of many apps I've noticed. So do remember, users are going to swipe up from the bottom of the screen these days. It's something new that they never used to do very often. Uh, and it, you know, you should pay attention to that. Users can also turn this off, but they probably won't. Um, all these things are completely unacceptable in R7. Don't do bevels, drop shadows, gradients. Um, R7 is apparently smooth and layered. I don't know what that means, but um, I'm sure he does. So smooth and layered, it's very important. I assume smooth and layered is like Johnny Ive's beard or you know, some, something British. It's all very good. Okay, so iOS 7 actually has a fairly strong design language, as we can see, and it's, it's all about translucency, movement, colors, and things that are not in any way representative of the real world, which is great. I'm not making fun of that. It's a really nice new UI. 
It's just Apple's not entirely sure how to describe it themselves yet. I'm sure they'll become more accustomed to that as they get on. The new UI has some, some principles that are somewhat the same as the previous UI, but also slightly different. Starting and stopping, for example, is basically the same. Apple still says you should absolutely not have a splash screen. If your app is a calculator, it should launch into a picture of a calculator and then slowly become a calculator once it's actually launched. It should not present any sort of splash screen or loading interface that lets you enter the calculator screen. This is just bad. Like, no, nobody wants to do this, and, and too many apps are doing this still. Okay? So don't, don't do that. That's still the same as iOS 6, but I just want to stress that because so many apps still do it. The other thing I want to stress is you should never quit the app. So many apps either crash, which is probably one of the only ways you can quit, or actually call the apps quit function, which is the correct way, but still not allowed, and actually provide an exit button. Like, the most common victims of this are custom web browsers. For some reason, they love doing this. Uh, you should never allow the user to quit your app. User taps the home button is the only way the app exits. Along those lines, saving and restoring state is more important than ever in R7, because your app can be terminated in all sorts of new and exciting ways. So please remember that. Let's talk a bit about layout now, uh, specifically tap targets. Um, this has not changed at all, but it's worth mentioning because with iOS 7, there's a little bit of a blurring of lines between what's actually a button and what's not. Um, if anyone's looked at things like the, the top bar on iOS 7, they'll see what used to be clearly delineated buttons are now just floating text. So you have to be very careful in terms of what users think they can tap on because they'll try and tap on lots of things. And the user's finger is really imprecise. The meat, meat cursors are not precise, like mouse cursors. Uh, so you need to compensate by this by making tappable controls fairly large. And Apple's recommendation has not changed. Um, the picture on the left is good, and the picture on the right is bad. The minimum size, something you expect the user to tap on should be is 44 by 44. That's basically it. Um, pretty simple. So good, bad. Lots of things still do this. Um, this is slightly new in terms of how Apple recommends you do it for iOS 7, but it's common sense to anyone who's been developing for iOS for a long time. Stuff that's important should go in the red bit. Stuff that's not important should go in the white bit. That's basically it. Um, you make it easy for a user to focus on the main tasks they want to do by pushing the stuff that's important into the, the corner of the screen where they're looking. Yes, John? Yes, it possibly does, but you, need, you can't think about that in advance. So you need to design your app thinking about one way, and then you, you can, if you want to offer a preference to flip it, you might, but most apps probably don't need to do that. Yes, it definitely does. And you can, you can detect which, which setting your user has and flip your UI appropriately. But when you're thinking about what, designing a UI from the beginning, you should not think about all these things at once. You should design one UI for your culture, and then once you've made it work, you can figure out the differences you need to adapt it. That's my opinion, but yeah. Um, R7 really emphasizes using weight and visual weight and balance to show users the relative importance of things on the screen. So large items, are catch the eye, obviously, and small ones don't. Um, users think bigger things are more important. So in this case, the most important thing, the most likely thing that Apple thinks a user will want to do while they're on a call is end the call, which is probably correct in most cases. So the most common thing they're going to want to do while they're on a call is finish it. And the other things are going to be slightly less important, but still pretty available. Um, yeah. Let's take a quick look about navigation. Um, the way your app navigates is as important to your app as how the screens look. Because if things just slide up on top of each other, and that's the only thing you use as navigation, it's going to feel really weird. Uh, so the feel of individual screens is important, but so is the way you move between those screens. Uh, people tend to be unaware of the navigation experience in an app until it doesn't meet their expectations. So you should make it feel like it's totally natural. Um, there's basically three main types of navigation in iOS. There's hierarchical, flat, and content-driven. Apple calls it experience-driven. I don't know what that means. It's content-driven. Um, in a hierarchical app, users navigate by making a choice per screen until they reach their destination. They get deeper and deeper. Uh, users must retrace some of their steps to get back and go to a different destination. So they're going in and out of a hierarchy. Uh, it's pretty simple. Settings and mail app are really good examples of hierarchy. I'm sure you're all familiar with those. Um, flat structures. Users navigate directly from one category to another. Uh, the music app or the app store are really good examples of this sort of structure. This hasn't changed in R7. It's just Apple has chosen to emphasize it a bit more. Did that animate? Yeah. Cool. And 
experience driven. Uh, navigation is defined by the experience. So you might tap parts of the app and then the flow changes as what you're doing. Uh, games are probably the best example of this. But you can make an experience driven app that is not a game for sure. Uh, books are possibly an experience driven app if you jump through using the table of contents. Content driven is better though. So there's a lot of different ways users navigate around your app. I'm sure you're familiar with them from IL6. They've very, changed very little in IL7, but it still is worth acknowledging some of the ways they've changed. Um, all these things come from UIKit, which is Apple's UI library, as I'm sure many of you know. Navigation bars, they're really ugly now, because um, you can't tell what's a button and what's not. If anyone's used something like Foursquare, the leave tip screen, the title of the screen is leave tip and the button in the corner is leave tip and the thing you go back to says menu. So the top of the screen has three pieces of text that say menu, leave tip, leave tip. And they all look the same. Um, this is a problem with i7 that I'm sure people will figure out as they get better at designing for it. Um, but basically a navigation bar helps users navigate through an information hierarchy and manage screen contents. It's pretty simple, it's only changed slightly but it's very ugly now. Tab bars let you switch between different subtasks or views, again, it's not so ugly, but it's still pretty right. Toolbars perform actions related to objects in the current screen. You guys know this. Bar buttons are now ugly and not obvious. Um, yeah, I don't know what's going on with the up and down arrows there, but they're not working very well, are they? Um, what's kind of new and interesting in R7 is activities. Um, activities represent a system provided or custom feature uh, that can act on the thing you're currently working with. And I, if, I, if I wasn't sure they were far too smug to do this, I would think Apple maybe borrowed this from Android because Android kind of has an intense and activity system that works basically the same way as this. Basically users can tap a button that brings up this activity window and then they can access system provided or user provided activities and they can act on the content they're looking at. Um, so system provided activities, so stuff provided by Apple, can look like either the top ones or these ones. They can look full color or they can look like this. Um, the really annoying thing is Apple doesn't dictate what the difference between these two is. Apple has arbitrarily decided some go there and some go there. Um, realistically, stuff that you do is only ever going to go uh, here. So, I, th I think so, but Ap Apple doesn't use it consistently, though. So sometimes Apple puts things that open things down here and then puts them up here. So yeah, it's not it's not super consistent. But I think Apple just arbitrarily decided there's two different icon styles because it looks visually quite nice. It's not necessarily usable, but whatever. You need to remember activities because it's a really good part of iOS 7. So modality is also really tricky on iOS. It hasn't really changed much. It's still tricky. Um, modality is the mode in which something is experienced. So users can do tasks in modal, modal boxes without distractions, but it, it prevents them from doing whatever they were doing before. Um, you should really minimize the amount of modal experiences in your app. Uh, alerts, things that slide up, and of course the activity plus share screen. You should only ever use a modal task if it's absolutely critical to get the user's attention or it's a self-contained task that has to be completed or abandoned in a specific time frame. Or maybe something to get the user's data saved or get the user's data out of the app that has to be done for them to proceed or exit the app. You should keep modal tasks really simple. Um, they should be short, simple, and very, very focused. You don't want your users to experience a modal view um, as a mini app, which is kind of what a lot of apps do. So. There's like the app and then there's like the, the, the experience to save something, which is really silly. People will forget what they're doing previously if they get stuck in a modal loop. You should always provide an escape from a modal task. Um, people, one, one thing that people don't do very well, particularly with R7 because it's kind of changed, it's muddied the way people think about the app's hierarchy, is they don't necessarily uh, present the, what, what their app is going to do to the user's data when they dismiss a modal view. So you should also make it really obvious as to what the fate of the user's data will be when they act on something in a modal view. So sometimes it's not clear what will save, what will dismiss, what will be deleted. So it's really important to make that obvious. In the same vein, you should make buttons obvious. Um, if the task 
that they're working on, it has a hierarchy of views. Make sure users know what's going to happen when they tap the done button. So things move around in weird ways and people get confused very easily. Minimize alerts. They're modal views that are really annoying. Uh, alerts should only ever be actionable things. They should never be, hey, this is something that's happened and then an OK button to get rid of it. They should be, you know, something, something, something. No, reply. They both act very specific actions. Um, alerts interrupt a user's experience so significantly that you should be really, really careful as to how you use them. Need to respect notifications. Um, users set preferences in settings as to how they want your app to notify them. Um, if you don't abide by those preferences, users will just turn off notifications and you won't be able to do whatever it is you wanted to annoy them with in the first place. Okay, animation. This is one of the really big new things in iOS 7. Um, Apple stresses constantly that it is the most important part of your app's design. So it's more important than clarity and deference and all that apparently. Animations should always have a purpose. Um, and there's three distinct purposes behind animations in my opinion. They can communicate status or provide a feedback of something. They can enhance the sense of direct manipulation that a touchscreen device gives you. Or they can help people visualize the results of something they've done. So those are the three purposes of animation. We're gonna take a quick look at some of these things. These are some good animations that are very simple. Communicate status. Status bars animate filling up, giving info on the status. Enhancing manipulation, swiping photos in the Photos app has momentum, so it feels like you're really controlling something. Direct control is a really good feeling. And visualizing results. When you delete something, it slides away, reinforcing the fact it's gone. It's really important. Those are the three different things. Very simple, but very important. Should be really cautious with animation. Um, if your app is not a really immersive experience, and you suddenly put animation everywhere, users will think it feels excessive or gratuitous and just leave. Um, it'll distract from the app's actual flow and the actual functionality of the app, and possibly just decrease performance. Um, UIKit has a whole bunch of dynamic behaviors you can add to it now, and the motion effects can particularly make people sick, as some people have noticed in the media recently. So used appropriately, um, these motion effects can definitely increase your user's understanding of what's going on by better explaining how things are deleted or where they've gone when they've moved. But if you use them badly, they'll just confuse things. A great way to test this is with slightly older people. I like to test apps with my mother, because if she doesn't realize where something's gone when she touches something on the iPad screen, it's not done well enough. If it's just gone away, it's probably wrong. Um, it'll become disorienting and then it'll just get worse from there. You should also be consistent with animations. Um, lots of apps implement really crazy over the top custom animations that are not at all consistent with any of the iOS built-in stuff. That's really annoying. Um, people are accustomed to the subtle animation used in the iOS apps that Apple makes. And people tend to regard the way the apps behave, the, the built-in apps behave, um, as part of the iOS experience that is sort of, it's an immutable thing that's there. And when we change them, they, they really freak out. So the way I, I like to explain this is, People have been using the internet for a long time, are very accustomed to a web browser, because they're, they're, they've used the internet back when it was really slow. So they're used to clicking the refresh button a few times if something doesn't work, or just like kind of waiting, hitting it over the head, waiting for it to work properly. And then people who are new to technology, which is the people who are more likely to be using these things, like iPads and iPhones, in a really hardcore, constant way, are not used to technology behaving in sort of this inconsistent manner of a web browser on a 28K connection. So they're not used to bashing it over the head to make it work. And if something doesn't quite, quite move the right way, they think it's completely broken and they'll just stop and rather than just trying it again. So when we use the device, we're like, oh, that's fine, I'll just go back and then go back in, now it's worked. But when people who aren't as experienced as us or are very new to technology use a device, if it doesn't animate quite the way they expect it to, they'll just think it's not working at all. It's very important to use your animations properly. So be really consistent. In addition to being consistent with Apple, you should be consistent with yourself. If you animate think one thing in one way somewhere or use a UI element in one way, you should use it the same way everywhere. Um, it's important to use this custom animation correctly and consistently so users can build on the experience they gain as they use your app and then become very familiar with every part of it. You should be realistic when you build apps um, with animation. Uh, people are willing to accept a bit of artistic license, but they will feel really disoriented if it doesn't make sense or appears to defy physical laws. So, 
despite Apple moving away from things that look real, you should make your animation look relatively real. Um, for example, if you reveal a view by sliding it down from the top of the screen, uh, you should dismiss it by sliding it back up because the users know where the view went. They associate the view with being up there. Um, if you dismiss the view by sliding it down to the bottom of the screen, you'll break the user's mental model of what's going on and they won't be quite sure where that, that, that view they slid down actually lives. So it makes sense the view lives above the screen, that's where it should go back. It's very important. Let's talk about, quickly about making sure your app holds up on different devices. Apple has a few devices. You're developing with the iPhone, the iPad, the iPod Touch. Slightly different characteristics. These are obviously two quite different devices. One has a big screen, and the iPad is maybe used less frequently, but for longer durations. And there's differences between kinds of iPad as well. iPad and the iPad Mini. Um, the iPad is bigger than the iPad Mini, which is fairly obvious, right? Um, but they have the same resolution, which means that your touch targets get a lot smaller on the iPad Mini. Um, Tweetbot is a really good example. It's got a list of icons on the left here. This is harder to tap on on the iPad Mini because they're all close together. Uh, it's kind of weird and annoying. You should always put controls that uh, work with the screen's content at the bottom because the user's hand is not transparent. Um, when they reach over a screen, they're obscuring it. So if they need to work with content that's at the bottom of the screen, yeah? Do you know if there's a way of detecting whether a person has done an iPad or an iPad Mini? I think you probably can do that, yes. It kind of goes against everything Apple recommends to do that, because an iPad is an iPad. But if you really wanted to, you could. Um, I can't think of any reason why you'd need to do that in any real meaningful way, though. If your UI is designed well, you can avoid needing to do that, which is probably easier than doing it to begin with, I think. Um, anyway, stuff at the bottom of the screen should be stuff that you expect the user to do with their content, because they can't see their content if they're trying to reach over it. And yeah, Isn't this a fantastic sign as well? First step is to arouse your neighbours in case of fire. This is from ANU University House in Canberra. Um, stuff that changes content goes at the top because it doesn't matter. They're obscuring the content by reaching over it to change the content. So to back out of this photo, they reach up and tap camera roll rather than tapping anything down here. Makes sense. Don't change gestures. Um, Apple's gestures are all really good. Don't make a double tap do anything but zoom in like it does on the Maps app. Don't make a pinch do anything but zoom in and out like it does in the Maps app. Don't like make a single tap do something that doesn't do a single tap in an Apple app. Do not overload gestures. It's really important in iOS 7 because there's gestures everywhere as part of the system, which means users are probably going to be more used to them than they were in the past. Now, we mentioned user-controlled font sizes before. Um, this is one final piece of the presentation, which has apparently gone for 32 minutes. Um, user-controlled font sizes are very, very new and very, very important. This is mail.app, this is the smallest system font size, and this is the largest non-accessibility system font size. You can actually make the font even larger than this if you go into the accessibility settings and tell it you're blind. Um, it can go really huge. But basically, if you're familiar with web development, you can actually define different parts of your, your app as body, footnote, headline one, headline two, and so on, and semantically mark up your app in terms of how the fonts behave, and then the system will set the size based on the user's preferences for each of those types of things and the users will be able to change it. And if your app does not behave like this or respond to this, and your users change the font size, it's just going to feel weird. As I said, I test things with my mother. She has the font size up quite a bit, and it's really easy to see when an app hasn't done this properly because everything just goes out of alignment or the font size doesn't change at all. And either way, is a surefire way to stop people using your app. Um, so please, this is probably the most important single change in terms of UX and iOS 7, in my opinion, because most apps have a lot of text. It's really important. So that's pretty much everything. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Did you record I did. I also put some material up on the Secret Lab blog, which also has some other fantastic articles. <laughs> any questions? No, I've got no idea. Do you? I, I had one that I thought of when I put the button in the Yeah? To make the, the label all in other caps and have a button. That, that could work, but it causes it look a bit weird. Yeah, it does look a little bit yeah. weird. Yeah. That's the way we'll start. Changing the color is usually enough, but that won't help in cases where you use a color blind. 
I think the current best solution, and maybe in addition to the caps thing, is to tint the background differently, so it kind of is a solid color in the middle and then lightens up on the outside or the reverse. But that seems to be what a lot of apps are leading towards. I don't think there's a great solution, but it's currently the best one. Anyone else? You can dance for 25 minutes otherwise. Nope. Thank you.